So today uh, I'm going to talk about software. Uh, I will do my best to do this in the time that I've been uh, I've been allotted. And really, what I want to talk about is why should we be continuing to invest in software? Um, and that's all the legal disclaimers. Um, so you know, the interesting thing is if you look at the computing power on the device that we all have, uh, it's got more uh, lines of software code and more computing capacity than the Apollo uh, sp uh, spacecraft had in 1969 going to the moon. Now, now imagine a world where the limits of what we can achieve are defined not by the constraints of reality, but by the boundless potential of technology. Now, I happen to love that line, but I actually didn't write it. It was written by ChatGPT uh, when I asked it to come up with a response to write an opening line for a speech on the impact of software. Um, and the reality is, I think we can all acknowledge that that impact has been enormous. But when you look at what that impact is, if you look at about 60% of workers today are employed in op occupations that did not exist in, 19, uh, in 1940. Uh, so that's data analysts, software engineers. And you know, we've had all these transitions from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy to a digital economy and now an AI-focused uh, uh, economy. But interestingly, when you look at kind of the speed with which technological development has happened, it's staggering what's happened over the last 75 years. Uh, in 1958, you had the integrated circuit. It was 30 years later, 1991, which is not that long ago, was the first website. Um, and then fast forward just 15 years to 2007, and you get the iPhone, which is a device on average we spend four hours a day on. And now, here we are 15 years later on the precipice of another major uh, paradigm shift in technology with artificial intelligence. What, we're, what are we asking artificial intelligence to do? We're basically asking software to run not based on a pre-programmed algorithm, but really kind of run itself by ingesting millions of data points to learn and decide what it should do. We're asking large language models to synthesize a 100-page research report in the time it would take any of us to read just the title. We're asking software programs to learn how to look at thousands of medical scans, review those scans with more accuracy than a, than a doctor. And we're asking chatbots to answer customers' questions quickly, accurately, and, and the, I think the most interesting thing is with empathy. Um, so why should we care about any of this? Um, you know, I was actually at a Council on Foreign Relations Board meeting this morning, and one of our topics was the economy, and it was not an uplifting conversation. Um, but one thing that technology has always done is it has a significant increase in productivity. Um, uh, and we don't, if I had a 45-minute presentation, I'd go through the data in more detail. Uh, but we're, regardless of which estimate you look at, um, the impact on the economy from AI, from productivity enhancement, is trillions of dollars of GDP. Um, and there's 10 or 15 different reports on this topic. But what I want to do today is try to use some examples. So what, you know, think about some industries where we're going to see the, these impacts. So manufacturing, if you think about how manufacturing worked in the past, today's manufacturing bears very little resemblance to that. What used to happen before was some things came in one side of the factory, they got assembled, they went out the other side of the factory. Um, today, and let's use Boeing as an example. The Boeing Dreamliner is made up of over two million pieces of individual equipment that are manufactured all around the world, then brought into as sub-assemblies and then put together. Well, millions of components can't come together with paper ledgers. Uh, you have a much more com complicated and distri uh, distributed supply chain, and so the amount of software you need to actually do that effectively is totally different. And right now, Boeing's using mission-critical software to plan schedules, track shipments, manage inventory consumption, evaluate the impact of delays. And then software is, of course, also used to run the planes, fly the planes. Uh, the average plane today has 14 million lines of software code. The average car today has 100 million lines of software code, which is why you do these over-the-air updates in your Tesla or increasingly any manufacturing car. But you know, where are things going? Uh, where we're go we've already gone from a local manufacturing model to a global model, leveraging the power of technology. But as we look forward, the next wave of innovation should bring things like better predictive maintenance to maximize factory uptime, as AI is able to take data from IoT sensors and maintenance logs to anticipate problems before they happen. 
And computer vision applications like landing AI will improve quality control by making it easier to, manuf uh, to consistently de detect manufacturing defects before they happen. Pharmaceuticals, and this is probably my favorite you know, example. Um, this is obviously not only a very capital intensive industry, but one that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time and billions of dollars to employ thousands of researchers to brainstorm hundreds of thousands, hundreds of novel compounds, test them uh, extensively, and then spend years doing clinical testing. But what about a world if you could supercharge a single research team to brainstorm thousands of compounds and then use AI to simulate thousands of human bodies to run a clinical trial in months, not years? That might only be three or four years away, five years away. We are seeing companies like Profluent, which is an inside portfolio company, uh, use technology similar to ChatGPT to suggest novel protein sequences to support drug discovery. So rather than testing hundreds or thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of compounds, you're actually able to know what it is you're attacking and have it kind of reverse engineer the compound you should be going after. Unlearn is using machine learning to create virtual patients that allow researchers to conduct clinical trials with fewer patients in the control group. But that revolution is happening across every industry. As companies invest in the promise of the future, about a, billion about a trillion dollars will be invested in software this year, which is roughly the size of the GDP of Saudi Arabia. Now, Insight has invested in digital solutions in each of these end markets and industries, and you know, which really creates a point. You know, people worry a lot about the volatility of software, uh, particularly in times like this. Uh, well, that volatility increasingly is just the volatility of the end market. Um, every industry's software component is going up. Uh, and if you just think about your day, you wake up in the morning, your iPhone probably wakes you up, that's your alarm clock, well, that's software. Uh, you turn on, uh, you, you, drive to, you drive to an ATM machine, really, you drive, your, your car is run by software, your ATM machine is run by software, you get to the office, you use software, your Netflix recommendation engine when you get home at night, that software, I can keep going. The percentage of our time that we're interacting with software is going up every year and will continue to go up every year for the next 20 years. But that being said, you know, it's people right now, it's a depressing time to be in tech. There's been a lot of volatility uh, and that's certainly been painful. But if you look over the long term, um, software has still performed extraordinarily well, right? So this is if you invested in the S&P 500 in 2005, you're up 275%. If you invested in software, you're up 1,000, right? Um, and there's not, when you look at the underlying growth characteristics of this industry, there really is no other, at least legal, SIC code that has better characteristics. Um, you know, public software companies today have got high growth rates, high margins, and they tend to be very highly recurring revenue. And this is a big change from 15 years ago when software companies were primarily license models as opposed to recurring revenue models. So the, 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 the power of the business model today is dramatically different and therefore should lead to less long-term volatility than the business model of 10 or 15 uh, years ago. Um, and you know, even in a tough economy, what you're seeing is that, and this chart is not reading totally properly, but you know, 37% uh, of CIOs expect an increase in tech spend. 53% expect remain stable. And I can tell you from our CIO conversations, the thing I've been most struck with is how quickly large companies are adopting AI. Um, you know, we had a dinner with uh, 15 CIOs at very large companies. I did a very similar dinner 15 years ago talking about the cloud. 12 or 13 of them were not in the cloud. Six or seven of them said they will never go in the cloud. Of course, today, all 15 are in the cloud. We did a similar dinner just two months ago. 14, 12 out of 15 were using active AI applications in implementation today. Uh, I think we've all been surprised by the speed with which that adoption is happening. So look, what we think is that investing in technology is not in, about investing in the latest fad. You're investing in all the industries in the U.S. economy, all of which are going to have to digitally transform to continue to remain competitive. And that's why we continue to be excited to invest in software. Did I do it in 11 minutes? Perfect. Okay, there you go. See?
So I just have a, uh, just to kick off a couple questions. I don't know if we have time for the audience um, to, to chip in, but you know, um, as, as some of my LPs and GPs know, we have some heuristics we use at Alpha to select opportunities. Is there anything specific about AI of, of companies that, um, specific things that you're looking for? Is it data sets? Is it, you know, um, you know, is there, and if not, that's okay too. If, it, if you look at it just as a software continuum, is there something different about AI that's different? Yeah, I, I just had a minute to talk to the founder of Shield AI here a minute ago, but, um, you know, our, the, our portfolio, which uh, in our most recent fund is about seven to eight percent AI investments. Um, almost all of that portfolio was built in 2021. Now, normally when I tell somebody our portfolio was built in 2021, they're like, oh shit, you're going to lose money. Well, all those deals got done at a cheaper price than we could do them today in that one category, right? And so far, our bets have been much more on the kind of infrastructure layer of AI rather than the LLMs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, look, we had an earlier opportunity in ChatGPT. We didn't take it. Um, that one's probably gone. And the problem now is the capital intensity is so high. I mean, it's like investing, you're really investing in a chip company, okay? That's what yeah. you're doing. You're investing in a chip company. You're putting up a lot of capital to buy a lot of chips. Um, and that's, oh. uh, that's, a, that's, so high capital intensity models are not where we love to play. Right, we saw that rodeo in 2000 when they built out all the fiber, the infrastructure yeah. so there. So look, there definitely right? be, don't get me wrong, there's definitely gonna be winners. We just don't know how to pick them right now. Right? What about so, the vertical applications? That's uh, much more of, interesting. And th that's right. where we made, that's where we've made a number of bets in, in kind of various sub-segments of the medical vertical, where you're kind of taking a much more specialized, or a much more slice so we've got something in dental. We've got something in radiology. We've got so we've got things across that. We've done a number of things in bi the, the the intersection of biotechnology uh, and AI, like Profluent, um, where you're kind of figuring out how can you take and sometimes leveraging other models. You don't have to build your own model, right? There's plenty of good models out there. There's increasingly open source models. There are increasingly open source models that are being built that are much smaller, I, there'll be a big debate over time whether or not the incremental value of size of learning set, how important is that, right? Right, so. do, you, do you, you know, uh, you mentioned Shield, you know, and AI, that often causes some trepidation. I'm, I'm a big fan of the Dune series, which has a very dystopian yeah. view of uh, AI. Um, there's a lot of legal, ethical, regulatory quandaries, you know, um, where there's sort of little tolerance for error. How well, that's you, the issue. It's a little you... tolerant. I mean, listen, when, when, when you read about a, uh, a Tesla car on automatic drive hits somebody, it's on the cover of the New York Times. And yet, probably about 100 people will die today in car accidents caused by human error. Uh, and there's no articles other than the local paper, right? Um, and so there's not... Uh, people don't like to get killed by computers, but they don't seem to get mined if it happens by a person. But I'm, I'm being like half facetious, but... Um, you saw it, if you remember, a few years ago when Boeing had the issues with their planes, right, which ended up being a software problem. I think it was scary for everybody. Like, you're, you're sitting there, you have no control, and the fact that a plane could go down because you don't have control and the software but, has but a But planes problem. are so much safer because they do have AI controls, I, right? Well, you don't have to make that right, argument to me. Right, right, um, so hard. But, right, but right, I think right, right. The, I'm, I'm trying to address right, right. your concern, which is that I think that there's always going to be... I think the regulatory constraints will kind of come in two flavors, right? One is like specific industry constraints, like what is self audit, like what is self driving, and what are you allowed to do and not allowed to do? How much risk are we willing to take? But but then what the White House and other people are focused on is a different type of regulatory kind of constraint, which is how do we make sure that uh, these models don't get in the hands of the wrong people? I actually think that's a very, very, very hard problem, uh, particularly as you get to models that are more open source uh, in nature and smaller in nature where I can run them on my phone as opposed to needing an NVIDIA, uh, you know, a big Invi NVIDIA data center. Great, Devin, thank you so much. You. We're like, I'm getting the red flashing light from my team. So I could, as long, we could as, speak I, as, long as I did it in time, I'm okay. You did, you did okay. a great job. Thank you so much for coming. All right, thank you.